I am sorry I cannot be at the meeting in person. I'm actually speaking from the Mayo Clinic in Minnesota in the United States. My remarks uh, concerning Cathy Wilkes will complement those of Alan Montefiore because we both edited the book that resulted from the seminars with Cathy Wilkes and David McFarland and I agree with Alan the lineup was mostly an axis between Alan and me on the one hand and between Cathy and David on the other and that divide shows that the scientists themselves are not neutral with respect to the philosophical concepts concerning animal and human behaviour. My own interest arose from a published interaction in 1967 with Charles Taylor um, following his book The Explanation of Behaviour where I argued that his account of teleology seemed to require that a difference in state at one higher level should not necessarily have a correlate at another lower level. There would therefore be a kind of gap in the mapping. And I found this difficult to accept. Taylor did however reply that while there might not be a physical gap, it might nevertheless be the case that after studying a series of correlations between, say, behaviour and neural states, only the higher level of behaviour might show a pattern that could count as an explanation. I found this a very interesting reply and countered that the consequence was that the issue of the validity of teleological explanations became a conceptual one, not an empirical one. Now, the seminars in which Cathy was such a major contributor formed the next stage. <laughs> I was still developing ideas on goal-directed behaviour that eventually became expressed in my recent books The Music of Life and Dance to the Tune of Life, where I describe ways in which teleological behaviour naturally develops during evolution, and that such behaviour contributes to evolution and so gives evolution a kind of directionality. I would have loved to have been able to try these ideas out uh, on the seminar all those years ago. Soon after the publication of the Goals book, I sent a copy to the distinguished expert on the intelligent behaviour of the cephalopods, J. Z. Young, and he wrote to say that he had enjoyed reading it, but he wasn't exactly complimentary as far as my own contributions were concerned. I think still the critical professor of his former student at University College London. But J. Z. Young was much more complimentary about Cathy's chapters, which he thought were clear and in his view correct. So why was J. Z. Young sympathetic to our debate at all and to Cathy's contributions in particular, even though he was critical of some of what Alan and I wrote. To understand that, we need to recall that J. Z. Young was the discoverer of the giant axon in the squid that enables it to produce a form of jet propulsion, in turn enabling it successfully to flee predators. This was the giant nerve on which Alan Hodgkin and Andrew Huxley worked to obtain the experimental data on which they constructed their famous model of the nerve impulse. But Young saw that this was the emergence during evolution of a goal-directed mechanism. The fast conducting axon was simply the physical means by which the response could be so rapid. He therefore regarded the mathematical analysis of the mechanism of the nerve impulse to be too low a level to explain the goal-directedness of the behaviour. Low-level explanations don't work, and for precisely the reasons that emerged from my interaction with Charles Taylor. So why did Young think more of what Cathy wrote than what Alan and I wrote? I suspect that he was nevertheless as many scientists were at that time, very suspicious of teleological language. Teleology, as J.B.S. Haldane is credited with saying, is like a mistress to a biologist. He cannot live without her, but he's unwilling to be seen with her in public. 
But I think there is no need for such shame. Organisms are agents and therefore teleological in their behaviour. Now, this is not the place to justify that statement. It suffices to say that it is a tribute to Cathy's work that such a noted expert on animal behaviour as Jay Z. Young thought highly of it. I want to finish these brief remarks by explaining what was missing during the 1980s debates. On my part, I was still under the sway of Irving Schrödinger's seminal 1943 book, What is Life? Seminal because it led to the central dogma of molecular biology, when Watson and Crick unravelled the double helical structure of DNA. Schrödinger made two important predictions. The first was that the genetic material would be found to be what he called an aperiodic crystal. It is precisely that characteristic that enables the DNA model mo molecule to encode so much information. But the second prediction of Schrödinger simply cannot be true. He argued that if one sees the genetic material as an information-dense sequence, how is it read to enable the characteristics of an organism to be transmitted from one generation to another? And he reasoned that the sequence must be read in a determinate manner if it was faithfully to transmit information. So he concluded that there must be a fundamental difference between physics and biology. You see, physics can be characterised as order from disorder. At the micro level, there is the essential stochasticity of quantum mechanics and of the random motion produced by kinetic energy in the molecules. Yet, the equations of thermodynamics, which describe large numbers of particles, generate gas laws that are determinate. And the answer to this paradox is that if motion at the particle level is genuinely random, then large numbers of particles will cancel their individual movements out to produce a constant pressure when hitting an object like the wall of a pressure vessel. Order at large scales, therefore, results from disorder at lower scales. But this is inconsistent with the Schrodinger view of biology in which the genetic material at the molecular level is supposed to be read in a determinate manner rather as an X-ray beam can generate an accurate and determinate picture of a crystal. Biology, he reasoned, therefore, was the generation of order at large scale from order at the micro scale and this cannot be true. We would now say that the molecules involved, that is DNA, are subject to a lot of statistical variation, copying errors, chemical and radiation damage, and so on, which then are corrected by the protein machinery that enables DNA to be a highly reproducible molecule. And this is a three-stage process that reduces the error rate from one in about 10,000 to about one in 10 to the 10 which is an astonishing degree of accuracy, less than a single error in copying a whole genome. The order at the molecular scale is therefore actually imposed by the system as a whole. So Schrödinger's idea that led to the central dogma cannot be correct. Now, why is this important to the debates on teleology? The answer is that the central dogma should no longer be used to justify a closed, determinate nature to biological processes. Just like everything else that depends on the motion of molecules, there is massive stochasticity at the lower levels. Only at the higher levels can there be order that a genuine explanation of behaviour requires. Furthermore, it is precisely through the constraints that the higher level imposes on the lower level stochasticity that we can develop a multi-level theory that privileges the higher level. Those constraints ensure that there is an asymmetry between the causal force of explanations at higher and lower levels. The higher level is genuinely causative because it is only from that level that one can under the, understand the constraints and how they arise. 
I conclude by noting that the issues on which Cathy uh, contributed so much 30 years ago are still very much live issues today. I certainly owe a lot to her insights and great contributions. Thank you very much from the United States.